The following sermon by Jonathan Edwards is taken from Matthew 13, verses 41 and 42. The wicked hereafter will be cast into a furnace of fire. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is part of the explanation of a parable that Christ had spoken in the hearing of the disciples, likening the kingdom of heaven to a man that sowed good seed in his field, among which an enemy sowed tears while men slept. In the words I observe, number one, who are they that are disposed? And two things are observable concerning them, namely, first, that they are wicked men. The Son of Man shall send his angels, and they shall gather out all things that offend, and them that do iniquity. Secondly, that they are wicked men in the visible kingdom of Christ. It is said the angels shall gather them out of his kingdom. They are sinners under the gospel and among professors of Christianity. These are the tares that are mixed among the wheat and grow with it in the same field till the harvest. Number two, it may be observed how they shall be disposed of. They are gathered out of Christ's kingdom and shall be cast into a furnace of fire. They no longer remain mingled with the godly, and many of them undistinguished from them. They shall now be made manifest and shall be disposed of in a manner which sets forth their exceeding differences from the righteous, as the tares were separate from the wheat, and bound into bundles and cast into the fire. Doctrine the wicked hereafter will be cast into a furnace of fire. Thus a manner is very often represented in the word of God. It is the most common representation of the miserable state that the damned are in, that they are cast into fire. And this may be understood either in a figurative or literal sense. The wicked will be cast into a furnace of fire in a figurative sense. And here I would show how that, that wrath of God which they shall suffer in their souls is well compared to fire, and secondly to a furnace of fire. First, the wrath of God which wicked men will hereafter suffer in their souls is well compared to fire. The wrath of God is very frequently compared to it in the word of God. Deuteronomy 32 Verse 22, A fire is kindled in mine anger, and it shall burn to the lowest hell. In Deuteronomy 29, verse 20, The anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man. In Jeremiah 4, verse 4, Lest my fury come forth like fire. In Lamentations 2, verse 4, He poured out his fury like fire. The separate souls of wicked men are spoken of in Scripture as being cast into fire. Thus a rich man in hell is represented as lifting up his eyes in hell, being in torment, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, and crying, Father Abraham, send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The wrath of God, working the spiritual misery of the damned, is well compared to fire upon the following accounts, namely, number one, is it gives a lively idea of the intolerableness of the torments that are suffered by souls under God's wrath. We find fire when applied to our flesh to be of a very tormenting nature, but only a little coal or spark of fire is sufficient to give us torment. How much more to lie all over in the fire? It may be that the body, when all involved in flames, doesn't feel torment so much greater than when persons only burn a finger or small part of their bodies in proportion as a whole body more than the parts, because the senses are soon in a measure benumbed and stupefied. 
yet it serves nonetheless to give us a lively imagination of dreadful torment. For we have an experience of the torment occasioned by fire. When touching any part of our body, we can easily conceive of the bodies being all in the fire and full in every part of the same quick sense. And this well represents to the misery of a damned soul under the wrath of God. And maybe there is scarce any other way that we can use that has such a lively conception of exquisite torment as to conceive of a person's lying all over in a fire without any abatement of sense. The Spirit of God seems to choose out such similitudes as represent the misery of the damned as most dreadful and torments most intolerable. The soul of man is more capable of torment than the body. Indeed, the body in itself is not capable of any torment. But my meaning is that man is capable of receiving far greater torments that are of a spiritual nature than he is by the body. Inward horrors and amazement may be to such a degree as far to exceed all possible bodily tortures. This we may rationally conclude. It is but rational to suppose that that part of man, that is his principal and most noble part, should be most capable either of happiness or misery. The body is the tabernacle and vehicle of the soul, and experience also confirms it. There have been instances of persons in this world that have been in so great horrors in their minds that they would gladly have exchanged it for any bodily tortures that could be thought of. And yet, doubtless, those were but light in comparison of that horror that the damned in hell suffer, on whom God pours out his wrath without mixture. The souls of the wicked, when they go from their bodies, will, as it were, be tormented in a flame. They will be swallowed up in the fire of God's wrath, in which they must burn to all eternity. Number two. It is well compared to fire because of its consuming nature. Fire is of such a nature that it tends to destroy what it acts upon. It doesn't only torment the body of those that are cast into it, but it will altogether destroy them, consume them into smoke and reduce them to ashes. So the wrath of God will utterly destroy those that suffer it. Not that it will abolish their beings, but it will destroy all comfort, hope, courage, or well-being. Though it won't reduce the soul to nothing, yet it will bring it to that state which is worse than non-entity. The misery that arises from the wrath of God cannot be endured by the souls of men. Isaiah 33, verse 14. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? The soul will utterly sink down, and will be, as it were, entirely crushed before it. The strength of or courage of the soul won't stand before the wrath of God any more than stubble will stand before the flames. The destruction that the wrath of God will work on ungodly men is in scripture compared to the fires consuming them and burning them up. Psalm 37 verse 20 But the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as a fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. They shall consume away. God is said to be a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, verse 29. Number three. It is well compared to fire, as fire is of a very powerful nature. When in God's hand it rages with a dreadful power and an irresistible violence, there is no withstanding of it or stopping its course, but it carries all before it. Fire herein is very lively emblem of the wrath of an almighty God. No creature can stand before an angry God. Psalm 76 verse 7 And who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? Nahum 1 verse 6 Who can stand before his indignation? 
and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger. His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. They were wont of old to build their fortifices on high, steep rock or rocky mountains. These are the strongest places, but these shall be no defense before his indignation. But these rocky mountains shall be thrown down by him. As here, so in many other places, the wrath of God against ungodly men is called his fury and fierceness. And so is very well compared to a raging fire against which there is no standing and whose fury there is no stopping or assuaging. Psalm 90 verse 11. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Great men are small, strong or weak, are all alike before an angry God, and will be found so when he comes to pour out his wrath, which none can withstand. The dens these mighty spirits hide in cannot withstand the mighty wrath of God. All God's enemies are to his wrath as the briars and thorns to the flames, and as a chaff before the whirlwind. Wicked men in hell shall feel the power and strength of this anger of God. Second Thessalonians 1 verse 9 Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Number two The wrath of God these wicked men will suffer hereafter is well compared to a furnace of fire. The wrath of God on wicked men is in Scripture compared to fire in different manners. Sometimes it is compared to a storm of fire, as in Psalm 11, verse 6, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire in brimstone, and in horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. The destruction of Sodom, which was overthrown in a storm of fire, was a type of the eternal destruction of the wicked. Sometimes it is compared to a lake of fire, and sometimes to a furnace of fire. The Spirit of God contrives to represent the damnation of hell by the most dreadful similitudes that the earth affords, and therefore compares it to fire. But that is not enough. It doesn't only compare it to fire, but to a furnace of fire, to fire of the most fierce and vehement heat that ever man has been acquainted with. Furnaces are made for those uses that require the most extraordinary fierceness of heat. In them the heat is raised to the utmost intense degree that human art is capable of. Our Savior says the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them that do iniquity, and shall cast him into such a fire. This will give us a still more lively imagination of the misery of the damned. What a dreadful idea does it give us of misery to think of such a poor, feeble worm as man, in the midst of a furnace with a heat of the utmost possible intenseness and fierceness, and there remaining from day to day alive. If it were possible for the body of a man to continue in such a fire and not be dissolved, how soon would every part of the body within and without be red hot with fire, all bright with a glowing heat, like a bright coal. And if we should conceive it to be possible that the body under all should retain all its sense, and should endure torment in proportion to heat, what dreadful torment would this represent, and how dreadful to remain in such a case one hour after another, and from day to day, and from week to week, and from month to month, and year to year, and age to age, to all eternity. But yet this is no more than the scripture represents the misery of the damned to be. All wicked men may assure themselves that unless they repent, their case will be as dreadful as this comes to. They shall endure a misery that may well be represented by this. Yea, the wrath of God is more dreadful than any material fire, as the substance exceeds the image and shadow. 
Material fire is but as painted fire in comparison to the future and eternal wrath of God on ungodly men. Number three. This need not seem strange if we consider whose wrath this is, that it is the wrath of the great God, and is called his fierceness and fury, as though God, in executing punishment on ungodly men, acted like an almighty being enraged. What can give more terrible apprehensions of the misery of the wicked than this? Can anyone think that it is a small matter that the scripture calls it the fury and fierceness of an almighty, infinite being, especially when we are told that none knows the power of God's anger, and that his wrath is as his fear, or answerable to his awful greatness and majesty, and that he executed justice that he might show his wrath and make his power known? And then if we consider the deserts of the sins of wicked men, how that one sin deserves eternal death, and then consider how holy sinful men are by nature, and how many sins they have been guilty of, and how highly aggravated, thus I have shown how wicked men will be cast into a furnace of fire in a figurative sense. Number two, it is very probable that wicked men after the resurrection shall be cast into a furnace of fire in a literal sense. It has been a question agitated among divines whether there be any material fire in hell, and whether there be or not in that hell that the separate souls of ungodly men are cast into, yet it seems a case not so disputable that there will be in that hell that the wicked shall be cast into after the resurrection. For then not only the souls of wicked men will be cast into hell, but their bodies too, as Christ teaches. Matthew 10, verse 28. Fear him that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. And whether the separate soul be capable of being tormented with material fire, yet there is no doubt but the body is. There is no reason why we should not suppose that Christ at the day of judgment will send away the wicked on his left hand, into a true and proper fire to be their dwelling place forever. The bodies of the wicked will be tormented as well as their souls, or else how are their bodies cast into hell? Christ bids us fear him that will cast both body and soul into hell, where he speaks of this as one thing that will add to wicked men's misery, that their bodies shall be cast into hell. But how would this add to their misery if their bodies were not to suffer as well as the soul? And as to the manner of the body suffering, we have no other account in scripture but this, that they shall be cast into a fire. And inasmuch as there is nothing in the nature of the thing that renders it in any way impossible, there is no reason why we should not understand it of a real proper fire, or that we should go about to seek for some figurative sense. There is no need of figurative fire to torment the bodies of men in, however it be as to their souls. And then the scripture is more plain in this manner still, for we are told in Second Peter 3 verse 7 that the heavens and the earth that are now kept in store, reserved to fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The plain meaning of which text is this, that the heavens and earth that now are, are kept in store for fuel for that fire, that is to be for the perdition of ungodly men, and certainly that fire with which this material heavens and earth are to be burnt, is material and not spiritual fire. The scripture is most plain and undenied that the world at its end is to be burnt with proper fire. The apostle in the aforementioned place is speaking of the former destroyed a second time by fire, 2 Peter 3, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. We have as much reason to understand the fire being composed of material fire as the water being composed of material water. This may well be called a furnace of fire upon the account of the exceeding heat of it. See what the same forementioned apostle says of it, Second Peter 3.10. The element shall melt with fervent heat. 
The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. The heat shall be so, so fervent that it shall melt the very elements and burn up the very earth. We may argue the exceeding heat of this fire from reason. The heat of the fire may be argued from the greatness of it. A great fire is hotter in any particular part than a little one. As when a house is on fire, the heat in a particular part is much hotter than in a small fire of the like fuel. How great then will the heat be in that fire when the world is on fire, when the heavens and the earth that now are shall all be in one common flame. That will be a great furnace indeed. And what exquisite torment indeed will wicked men endure whose bodies shall burn in that furnace, and yet not be consumed or killed or at all be numbed. Their bodies then won't be frail mortal bodies as they are now. They will be so made by the Creator as to be fitted to endure torment forever and yet not to be abolished. The violent heat of this furnace will torment but not consume their bodies. Application The use I would make of this doctrine is to warn persons to take heed that they don't go on in wickedness, lest this be their portion, lest they hereafter be cast into this furnace of fire. Every one that has the least exercise of reason and believes there is any truth in this doctrine, or does but only think it the least probable, can't but own that it is worth a man's while to do whatever lies in his power all the days of his life, to be at any trouble, to be at any expense, to deny himself of every evil inclination, rather than run the venture of enduring this misery. To lie roasting and burning in a fire, and not only fire, but in a furnace of fire, and there to be all as a flaming brand, or as a glowing coal in the midst of that fire, and yet to be alive and sensible in that forever? Is it not worth a man's while to deny himself and take utmost pains day and night to avoid this misery? The least degree of reason is enough to teach a man that it is. There is not one that now hears, however negligent about his own deliverance from hell, however senseless about it, that has so little reason, but that he must own it. If we should suppose such a thing that a man can lie in such a furnace as refiners use here on earth for twenty-four hours, and the fire should have its full force upon him, but only his body should be kept from being dissolved and consumed and kept alive, and being in every part as full of sense as at other times, and then at the end of the twenty-four hours should be delivered. What can we rationally judge such a man would not be willing to do? What pains would he not be willing to take? What would he not be willing to deny himself of rather than to endure such another twenty-four hours? But what is this to lying in such a furnace, or one more dreadful to all eternity, to the spending one long day after another in such a condition, so years and year after year, and wearing out millions of ages in such a condition, a lying so till the pleasures of earth grow old and the sun grows pale with age and ceases to shine, and repeating millions of such ages, and after all being no nearer to an end than the very first minute, and all this while being every moment of it in such dreadful torment. How little do such consider these things that are careless of their souls, that are cheerful and merry in courses of sin. Here consider number one. You have sure grounds to believe that what Christ has said about this future misery of the wicked is a certain truth. It may be you may flatter yourself that it is so very awful and extraordinary as to be incredible, that it is too amazingly dreadful to be true, but you have the most sure grounds to believe the truth of it. You have as much reason to think it is true as you have to think that there is a just God that governs the world. If there be such a God that governs the world, then doubtless he has given laws to his creatures. And if he has given laws, those laws must have sanctions, that is, rewards and punishments. 
But if there are no punishment for the creature's breach of the law, then doubtless God has told his creatures what they are. What an absurdity is the supposition of there being a lawgiver to give laws to his creatures and enforcing his laws with threatenings of punishments, and yet not to tell what those punishments are. It is a contradiction. For if the lawgiver doesn't tell what the punishments are, how can they be any enforcement to his laws? Punishments are no otherwise a sanction to a law, that is, they are told of or threatened. But if God has told us of these punishments, where is it if not in the Bible? If the great lawgiver has given us his threatenings, where are they to be found if not in this book? But there is also abundant positive evidence that he has told us in the Bible that the scripture is his word, as might be mentioned if there were time. So that there is no room to flatter yourself that it won't prove true. You will certainly find it so by sad experience if you go on. However dreadful Christ's words are, they shall be found to be true. And heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or tittle of his word shall not pass away. Number two. Consider that Christ's words are no hyperbole. When he says the Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 13, verses 41 and 42, he doesn't speak hyperbolic language, or so that the literal sense of the words is above the true meaning and intent of them. If the literal meaning of the words is above the truth, then why did Christ say that the wicked shall be cast into a furnace of fire? Why did he not only say they shall be cast into a fire? There can be no other account to be given of it than that he knew that to say so did not so well represent the torment nor come so near to the truth as to say they shall be cast into a furnace of fire. It is evident that Christ purposely chose out the most terrible thing, the hottest sort of fire that men are acquainted with, to represent hell by, as though he wanted something fully to set it forth. But if in this he went beyond the truth, and it would have been nearer to the truth only to have said they shall be cast into a fire, why did not Christ content himself with that? Number three. You may consider that what is said in the text will be literally true. It is not only not a hyperbole, but it will also be true without a metaphor. Your very body shall be cast into a furnace of fire, and there shall lie alive and sensible to all eternity. It may be you are not so apt to be terrified by being told about spiritual misery, about horror of mind, and the pouring out the wrath of God upon the soul, because these are spiritual things that you have not so clear an apprehension of. Men generally have a much more dreadful apprehension of outward pain and torment of body than of spiritual. But you may consider that you will not only suffer horror of mind, but your body shall be cast into hell if you go on in sin. When you look upon a fierce fire and see the coals in the most glowing heat or cast a worm or a spider into the midst of it, you may consider that it will be literally so with you. Your body shall be cast into such a fire as that insect, only with this difference that whereas that is presently past feeling in life, you shall live to bear torment forever, and that the fire in which you shall burn will be more dreadfully fierce and vehement. Number four. You may consider that your body will be capable of more torment than it is now. When the bodies of the wicked rise at the end of the world, they will purposely be made so as to be capable to endure a great torment, or the capacity of the soul will be enlarged in another world for that end, to be capable of misery. So there is no reason to think but that the capacity of the body will likewise be enlarged, to be capable of more torment. Number 5. A body cast into a furnace of fire does but partly represent the misery that wicked men shall suffer. If we take it in a literal sense to represent the misery of the bodies of wicked men, 
that misery of their bodies is but a part of their misery, and that the smallest part. Besides all this outward bodily torment, the soul will suffer spiritual torments. There will be at the same time the greatest horrors and agonies of mind, the spiritual inflictions of God's wrath in the soul. The wicked shall feel the mighty vengeance of God in the whole man. They shall not have a quiet soul to support them under the torment of body. Job says the spirit of a man will sustain when there is inward peace and comfort. It will do something at least towards supporting the man under extreme outward torment. But the souls of the wicked shall suffer within themselves more than their bodies. And if we take their being cast into a furnace of fire in a figurative sense to signify the misery of the soul, it does it but in part. There is no similitude that is used that fully represents it. And that is evident because there is such a variety of similitudes used. Sometimes the misery of hell is compared to darkness, to the blackness of darkness. Sometimes a worm inwardly gnawing and never dying. Sometimes to floods of great water, to waves and billows. Sometimes to fire. Sometimes to a storm of fire. Sometimes to a lake of fire. Sometimes to a furnace of fire. The reason why the Holy Ghost uses so many similitudes to represent it is because no one alone fully does it justice. If any one similitude alone fully represented the misery of hell, then there would be no need to use more than that, but one is not sufficient. Therefore many are used. One more lively represents one part, another represents another, but none do any more than partly exhibit it the wicked cast into a furnace of fire, Jonathan Edwards, May, 1733. Stillwater's Revival Books is now located at PuritanDownloads.com. It's your worldwide online Reformation home for the very best in free and discounted classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, MP3s, and videos. For much more information on the Puritans and Reformers, including the best free and discounted classic and contemporary books, MP3s, digital downloads, and videos, please visit Stillwater's Revival Books at PuritanDownloads.com. Stillwater's Revival Books also publishes the Puritan Hard Drive, the most powerful and practical Christian study tool ever produced. All thanks and glory be to the mercy, grace, and love of the Lord Jesus Christ for this remarkable and wonderful new Christian study tool. The Puritan hard drive contains over 12,500 of the best Reformation books, MP3s, and videos ever gathered onto one portable Christian study tool. An extraordinary collection of Puritan, Protestant, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, Covenanter, and Reformed Baptist resources. It's fully upgradable and it's small enough to fit in your pocket. The Puritan hard drive combines an embedded database containing many millions of records with the most amazing and extraordinary custom Christian search and research software ever created. The Puritan hard drive has been produced to assist you in the fascinating and exhilarating spiritual, intellectual, familial, ecclesiastical, and societal adventure that is living the Christian life. It has been specifically designed so that you might more faithfully know serve and love the Lord Jesus Christ, as well as to help you to do all you can to bring glory to His great name. If you want to love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then the Puritan hard drive is for you. Visit PuritanDownloads.com today for much more information on the Puritan hard drive and to take advantage of all the free and discounted Reformation and Puritan books, MP3s, and videos that we offer at Stillwater's Revival Books.